He's the youngest and first African tailor to open shop on London's esteemed Savile Row. I think when you set a goal for yourself and it's something that uh, you're very passionate about and you believe, you know, you can't be sure on the timings, but it, uh, I think actually the achievement of the goal is, is, is always very possible and, 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 I, and I prove that. The son of Ghanaian immigrants, Oswald Boateng has combined the traditional art of tailoring with high fashion to create bespoke couture. So, o Oswald Boateng in three words. Driven, visionary, and cool. His cheapest suit comes with a price of just under $3,000, whilst the most expensive will set you back more than $30,000. I've definitely made tailoring fashionable and made put, put the, uh, at the forefront of menswear tailoring. Well, when he arrived in, officially arrived in 2002, he certainly made an impact. He had a huge street party, closed down the street to traffic, thousands of people came. I think the last people to do that were the Beatles, and it tells you how long ago it was. So there was no missing his arrival. Today, he's the go-to guy amongst the Hollywood elite and even royalty. A young black designer out of England. His name is Oswald Boateng. Uh, Boateng, it's a B-O-A-Tang. Having dominated men's fashion for more than 25 years, Boateng is now adding African activists to his mantle. Do you see Africa being rich or poor? If you think Africa is poor, would you stand up, please? No, if you think Africa is rich, stand up. Born in Muswell Hill in North London on February the 22nd, 1967, Oswald Boateng was the youngest of three children. Growing up, he was inspired by the immaculately tailored suits his headmaster father wore to work every day. Boateng's mother, a seamstress, was also an early influence and gave her son his first suit at the age of just five. A double-breasted purple mohair suit was the start of a lifelong love of the sartorial. Fast forward a decade and Boateng chose to abandon a course in computer programming for fashion design. My girlfriend at college is the main, my main inspiration. I was studying computers at college, she was doing arts, um, painting with, and she could paint with both hands, left and right, so it was an amazing creative. And uh, she was doing a fashion show at college and she said, look, you know, uh, would you help me design this collection? I was 16 years old, studying computer programming, and at the time it was 0011, so it was the old, old, right at the beginning of it, because I believe computers were going to be the future. Anyway, she convinced me, and I did it, and I had a natural talent for, for designing. And then um, what I did is basically I uh, uh, was very quick to identify that this was something that could work for me, and um, I enrolled into uh, a fashion college to to study fashion. Boateng continued to design and make suits using his mother's sewing machine. At just 16 years old, he sold his first collection to a menswear shop in Covent Garden. By 1990, Boateng was able to earn a living by making bespoke suits. His designs were far from the ordinary. According to fashion journalist Helen Jennings, he was fast gaining a reputation for using silhouette and even color in a way that hadn't been seen before. It's definitely the, the leanness of the cut. It makes the most of the man inside, you know, and make them walk taller and look thinner, which everyone wants to be. It's also his use of colour, sort of bold colours, not just in the linings on the shirts that maybe you see elsewhere, but on the whole suits. And uh, also innovative textures and sort of unusual combinations of fabrics and, and shades, which kind of sets it apart and ha having that sort of fashion angle to the suit, but still a timeless appeal. Chris Cleverly, Boateng's longtime friend and business associate, describes their first meeting. He came up to me in a nightclub and said, I can make a better suit than the one you're wearing. And being a people barrister, it took me about five months to pay it off. And that's when we became, became friends. He did have a better suit than I did. <laughs> so that by itself distinguished him from me. Um, 
Very early on, we started doing things together in terms of business. Um, we worked very closely into looking at how uh, the whole classic as a twist concept of English tailoring could actually be brought out. And so we had a lot of conversations around those sort of things. Um, we were very, very keen on uh, seeing how we could progress the image of black people within this country. Um, you know, mainly by our own activities and by our own actions. From peacock blue to canary yellow, Botang was able to convince men to make the switch from the conventional greys and navies. Andrew Ramroop moved to Britain from Trinidad in 1970. Four years later, he was hired by Morris Sedwell, the only person on Savile Row who would hire a non-white tailor at the time. Ramroop himself is considered a pioneer in the world of bespoke tailoring. He explains how Botang turned tradition on its head. What Oswald has done exceptionally well is brought colour literally bought colour into men's clothing. Whereas the Savoy environment was very much a business-like image, uh, customers conforming to an image that they expected to be conformed into wearing dark suits, pinstripe suits, and a weekend suit would be on a Friday they will wear a brown suit. But back at home, there was still some convincing to do whether Boateng had chosen the right path. So my father's a teacher, headmaster, so he was uh, pure academic, so uh, the idea of me giving up computer programming for something which is creative was viewed as a very bad move. So uh, it took me years later to convince him that I'd made it, uh, the right decision. Boateng stuck to his trade, and by the age of 24, he became the first tailor to stage a show during Paris Fashion Week. I mean, the last few seasons, especially in London, menswear has come into its own. Menswear in general and luxury menswear has become a real talking point in fashion and he was you know, one of the forefathers of that movement. He very much was apart from, from what was going on in normal menswear and in a sort of, he was part of the tailoring world but he brought it into that high fashion world and I think a lot of people have followed in that path. The success of his Paris show led him to reach another milestone. In 1994, he became the first African tailor to open a boutique on Savile Row. Oswald Boateng's stellar rise has seen him reach a number of milestones. But perhaps the biggest came in 1994 when he became the youngest and first tailor of African origin to set up his own store along London's Golden Mile of tailoring. I opened shop on Savara, I think I was uh, 26 or 27 years old, which is one of the youngest days in history. But, uh, you know, I feel that the, the beginnings was, was, was quite, quite smooth for me, in fact. I think the, the, the big surprise, I think, was uh, maybe in the time frame that I was able to do that. You know, um, I think when you set a goal for yourself and it's something that uh, you're very passionate about and you believe, you know, you can't be sure on the timings, but it, the, I think actually the achievement of the goal is, is, is always very possible. And, 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 I, and I approve that. Undeterred by his experiences on Savile Row, it was Ramroop who encouraged Boateng to set up shop I feel, you know, humbled that Oswald found me an inspiration and aspired to be a Savile Row tailor. When I first met Oswald, um, he's principally a designer, and when I first met him, I encouraged him to come on to Savile Row. I said, look, I'm on my own, I need some company here. And uh, perhaps that encouraged him to, to look further into coming into Savile Row. While much was made about Boateng's Ghanaian heritage, he remained unfazed. One of the ways in which Oswald deals with his challenges is to look at the opportunities, not the challenge. So if you talk to Oswald about it, then what you'll hear is, actually it was an opportunity. I was the only one. Um, you'll hear him say that actually, you know, by coming in from that direction, I was able to look at it in a different way. So he's a person who looks for the opportunity rather than the challenge. And that's enabled us very much in dealing with Africa's um, issues to just see them as an opportunity. Boateng himself saw his success stem from merit. In terms of me being viewed as the first, I think it's a fair enough label because there's not many, you know, uh, or at least when I started, many uh, men, men of colour 
in that position. And I feel now there's, there's lots, right? So now the, I've inspired a lot of young men to want to get into the business. In fact, not just black, but from all over the world, right? Because of the impact I've had on, on menswear. But it's great to see, whereas I was only one at the beginning, to see many other uh, black, talented creators out there who are also catching the, the eye of the, of, the, of the fashion industry. Boateng's success established him as a firm favorite amongst the couture crowd. In 1996, he was awarded the prize for the best male designer at the Trophée de la Mode in Paris. Boateng's documentary, A Man's Story, shot over a period of 12 years, begins in 1998. The year saw him deal with the end of his first marriage and bankruptcy due to an ill-fated expansion in the Far East, hit by the Japanese banking crisis. You spend so many years of your life with somebody and you won't even, you won't even have a friendship because it's been destroyed. It's all become about money. To make matters worse, the following year his Savile Row shop was robbed. The thieves made away with $120,000 worth of clothes from his autumn winter collection. Though visibly shaken, Boateng set out to rebuild his brand with even greater ambitions. Along the way, his personal life also took a positive turn when he met Russian model Gunel, who he'd eventually marry and have two children with. By the year 2000, Boateng was back in favor after winning the top menswear designer prize at the British Fashion Awards. It was during this time that he was also hired by French fashion giant Givenchy as its new creative director, a post he held from 2003 until 2007. I think it was, a, it was a natural fit for him because, you know, as a brand they do take risks and they, you know, they have that luxury audience. But again, he didn't do things by halves, like the same way he did not in Savile Row. So I think one of the projects he had was doing a fashion film in China and he enlisted 500 soldiers to come and be part of it. Just things like that that, you know, just thinks, thinks differently and make, makes a mark wherever he goes. With both his personal and professional life back on track, Boateng was quickly emerging as a favourite amongst Hollywood's leading men, looking to be dressed in his flamboyant creations. You know, I'd say what I've, I've kind of made my mark in, in the industry is I've definitely made tailoring fashionable and made put, put the, uh, at the forefront of menswear tailoring. Because when I started, it wasn't, I mean, when I say tailoring structured men's clothing, because when I started, it wasn't fashionable. In fact, um, it was completely opposite. It was actually a dying concept for men's clothing. So I believe I've, 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 I've revitalized that. And I've also brought some very modern to it because I've come from a design background. And so I've always looked at how do I make this traditional concept very modern, very new. And now how I achieve that is my attention to detail. And so, uh, in menswear, it's not about being obviously different, but finding ways of creating differences in the, in the way that the lapel's positioned, in the notch positioning, the width of the lapel, the detailing around the cuff, you know, the, the flaps, the size of jets, and more importantly, the silhouette, and how that balances out with that. Along with Hollywood royalty, Boateng was also garnering the attention of the British monarchy. In 2006, he was awarded an OBE by Queen Elizabeth II for outstanding services to the clothing industry. It was during this period that Boateng began to draw greater influence from his African heritage. Around early 2000, I felt that um, it was time to have a link back with my African roots, because clearly I was using the color in the same way that you have as African fabrics, in terms of how the colors sit together. And so I realized that, you know, um, there was always a subconscious influence. And so I just said, look, you know, let's, let's use it. And I also was starting to feel more um, energized by my African roots. But Boateng's interest in Africa didn't just translate into his designs. He had his eye on something bigger. Oswald Boateng has made a name for himself designing perfectly tailored suits worn by the rich and famous. 
In 2011, he embarked on his most ambitious project to date, redressing Africa's aging and often non-existent infrastructure. He set up the Made in Africa Foundation with Chris Cleverly, along with Nigerian oil tycoon Kola Oluko. Their job is to fund feasibility studies for large-scale developments and infrastructure projects across the African continent. List. You know, we were very much a lone voice saying that Africa could grow exponentially. Um, we looked at the Chinese model and we could see how that, that, was, that increased in size very, very quickly um, in terms of its growth. And the same could be true of Africa. So what, what I, I ask everyone to look at when they think about Africa is to look at what it could be, what it could become. Um, and in terms of that, you know, there is no reason why Africa, with 15% with of the world's um, population, 20% of the world's land mass, couldn't have a GDP equivalent to that in terms of the global GDP. The idea behind the foundation first came about in 2007 when Boateng was asked to do a fashion show to mark 50 years of independence in Ghana. I set up Main Africa Foundation really because I was asked uh, to do an event for Ghana's 50th anniversary of independence. And um, the president of Ghana asked me to do an event to celebrate this uh, momentous occasion. So, um, you know, I was, I was excited by that. But what was really important to me was uh, I didn't still want to do an event, I wanted to have a much greater meaning. And so, uh, the president of Ghana was the president of AU at the time. And so I said, well, let's do the event while all the African presidents are present in Ghana. And so I did like an interesting fashion show and but what I also did is, is I kind of asked myself the question as well as if I could inspire these leaders and of what Africa could be in the next 50 years, what would that look like? And how can I communicate that to them? And how can I inspire them to believe in Africa's future? Boateng's vision culminated in this. I got some uh, big leaders, I got um, Jesse Jackson and Andrew Young to attend the event and speak about how they feel and what Africa represents to them. And also say that they want to be involved in Africa's future. Because I think that's very important. The diaspora, and I call African Americans part of the diaspora, are very important to Africa's future. So I brought that connection. And then what I said is, is if you have a blank sheet of paper and you're going to build your future, how would you build it? Would you build it like everyone else? Or would you look at everyone else's mistakes and do it better? And that's basically what was communicated. And I think what happened then, it was a start of everyone starting to understand that um, Africa has a different path and it has a different opportunity. And that the usual language around Africa of it being poor and, you know, and, you know, unreliable, corrupt, wasn't the only story. Boateng soon went from rubbing shoulders with Hollywood's leading men to world leaders. In 2013, the foundation, along with the African Development Bank, launched the $500 million Africa 50 Fund for infrastructure development across the continent. According to the foundation, this is Africa helping Africans, the ultimate trade, not aid policy. Back when we started this off uh, as, a, as a business in 2007, before it became the foundation, people actually thought the only way to develop Africa was with schools and with, with hospitals. Um, they didn't look at the South Korean model, which was one based on the fact that there was investment in that investment built, the, built the, um, their country out and great, created great growth. Um, we were able to see the, the very obvious statistics, such as uh, you know, that 7% of, of uh, trade in Africa is done within Africa and the rest of it's done externally. So, you know, in Europe, 60% of, of trade is done internally. So if we could even just increase, increase trade by 10, 15% um, more within Africa, then the growth in Africa as GDP would grow hu hugely. Among the 50 proposals earmarked, the Inga Dam is the flagship project. This is the world's largest carbon emissions reduction scheme. When completed, 
it will double the energy capacity across southern Africa. The Inga Dam project is, is one of the projects that's been identified and that one project um, will produce up to 44,000 megawatts of, of power. And as you all know that in Africa, it's called the dark continent and this will add another 30% of energy to the whole continent. So it's, uh, it's huge. And what that means is it will affect the GDP of the continent. So right now, the continent of Africa's GDP is around about maybe 7% as an average, but this will add another percent or maybe a percent and a half. So it's significant and that's just one project. There's 50 projects. The foundation believes that raising $500 million can lead to a further $100 billion worth of projects. This in turn has the potential to create nearly a trillion dollars of value, boost the continent's GDP by 2% and lift 200 million people out of poverty. Oswald stepping off the catwalk and actually getting involved in Africa, getting involved in sewers and getting involved in building drainage and building railways and building roads is the real stuff. But it's also the real stuff about, of design as well because what we're talking about is master planning the whole of Africa really. We're talking about what would work best, what would make an efficient, commercially acceptable, socially acceptable environmentally acceptable Africa would work for all its people and for all of its, all of its land as well. The vision needs to be is, you know, the continent of Africa will be the driving force for infrastructure for the rest of the world. Brain taking note the environment, we know now how the infrastructure can affect the environment, so we need to make it one with the environment. We know the important that quality of life is important as well. So all those things, the social impact of the development that we know and we've seen happen in China and we, 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 in one way we celebrate China's success but the quality of living maybe is not as, as great. So that sort of thing is we need to get right in Africa and we can because we're starting from scratch. The task of revamping the continent's infrastructure may seem a far cry from the glamorous world of fashion but there's more to Boateng than meets the eye. The great ability of a designer is the ability for them to actually look at the world and imagine what it could be. Take what's actually there and then build it together and then put it out as something that's usable. You know, and that's the, I think what the, Oswald's great quality is, is that his ability to see what's good from what is there. For Boateng, his passion for design will always remain. With plans to open up stores in Western Europe, North America, Asia and the Middle East, he's ready to expand his empire beyond Savile Row. But as the Made in Africa Foundation inches closer to its goal of $500 million, Boateng is equally committed to tailoring the continent's future. I do understand business. I do understand the potential of Africa. And I've learned that just by having my own business. And so I think I'm, uh, I see myself as also as a bit of a creative thinker. My future is, I think, a lot of uh, creative exploration in areas that maybe ordinarily you wouldn't expect a designer to be in, but uh, it's probably that's what makes me who I am. But what's interesting about this particular journey I'm having in Africa is I see so much, so much potential.